Y'all glad to be in church? Come on. Man, I'm glad that we can still have church on a holiday weekend. You guys can take a seat. Man, I'm excited about what God has in store for us today, what he's got for us in his word. And so let me just say before we get there, can we just celebrate again what God did last Sunday night? What has started, he will see through to the end. And that, I know we talked for several weeks, we were in a series called Doing Our Part, and it was all leading up to last Sunday night, but last Sunday night was not the end. Last Sunday night was just the beginning of what God's gonna do over the next weeks and months and years to come. Um, if we had to guess as to what the next few months and years were gonna look like, they're way more than we could ever imagine or think God's got something big in store. And we believe that in faith. We believe that in faith. And so, man, it was just awesome to see what he did last Sunday night. If you weren't here, you missed out, but you can still be a part, as Pastor Richie said earlier. So we hope we can all come together and see God do immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine. Um, well, God's got a word for us today. And so you guys that have your Bibles or your Bible app, you guys go ahead and turn in your scripture. We're gonna be in the Gospel of John. We're gonna be in chapter one, the first chapter of the Gospel of John this morning. And while you guys turn there, I wanna tell you a little bit about my daughter. I feel like I talk about her a lot when I'm up here. Um, but my daughter, Charlotte, she's two years old. And I can brag on her, right? That's okay. She's, she's awesome. She's awesome. And so I just want to just talk about my daughter a little bit. She is two. Um, how many of you got kids and you know what it's like to have a two-year-old, right? You know, you know what, what comes along with that. And so Charlotte's two. And so she's learning how to communicate. She's learning how to tell us certain things. And sometimes it comes out the right way, and sometimes it comes out the wrong way, and sometimes she gets frustrated because she can't really communicate that which she's trying to communicate to us, and so then she just starts pitching a fit, you know, and then we as parents start pitching a fit, and it's just a downward spiral, right, of, of parents of a two-year-old, you can relate. It's, it's trying at times when they want to communicate something to you, and they're having trouble doing it. You're not really understanding what they want. And so what we've learned as parents is if, if we know she wants something and she's trying to ask us for it, but she doesn't quite know how to say it, doesn't quite know how to communicate it, what we'll do is we'll say, hey, what, what do you want? What do you want? She knows what that means. And so then she can't all the time communicate exactly what it is. So we'll say, hey, show us, show us what you want. And so she'll, she'll take us by the hand, you know, and then she'll walk us. Usually it's to the pantry. You know, she wants, she wants some sort of snack that she can't have, you know. So inevitably we have to say no. It's almost dinner time, you know, but it's okay. We'll get some after dinner. Um, she did the cutest thing a few weeks ago. I have a guitar that sits in our living room, and I'll put on music at night after we do nap time. We'll listen to some worship songs, you know, and we'll have church, you know, during the week um, at night before we go to bed. And a few weeks ago, we were listening to some worship songs, and she came over. I was sitting in my chair, and uh, if you've been to my house, you know I have a reading chair that, you know, it's like the old man chair, you know. And so I'm sitting there in my chair, and she comes over, and she gets my hand, right, because she wants to show me what she wants. And so she gets my hand, and she walks me over to the guitar, and she says, play. Oh, my word. You know, that is... Oh, man, that makes me emotional just thinking about it because she wants me to play the guitar. And, man, that was just so awesome. And, but, but she will do that. She'll come get our hand and she'll walk us to the thing that she wants. And she sometimes will get the thing that she wants and sometimes she doesn't, right? Sometimes she doesn't. And so even though she doesn't always get the thing that she wants, there's one thing that she gets and she finds out what it is that she really needs, and that's us. 
See, she wants the toy, or she wants the fruit snack, or she wants, sometimes she wants our phone. She loves to look at the pictures on my phone of the baby, you know. Um, so she sometimes wants that, and sometimes we let her have it, sometimes we don't, just depending on the moment. But no matter what it is that she wants, what she realizes in that moment is that what she needs is us. What she needs is us. And sometimes we get confused, even as adults. This isn't just for two-year-olds, right? As adults, we get confused on the difference between the thing that we want and that which we really need. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And there's a scripture here in John chapter 1 that I want us to look at. We're going to be in verse 35 through 39. In John chapter 1, I've given you plenty of time to get there. If you haven't found it by now, there's no luck for you. There's no hope. And so we're going to put it on the screens for you, okay? Plenty of time to get there. John chapter 1, you see it on the screen. Here we go. Y'all ready? Is everybody ready? Okay, God's got something for us to see here today. It says this. It says, the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, okay? The next day, John, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples, When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? What do you want? I wanna speak today on I want more. I want more. Father, I know you've given this word to me And it's soaked and it's saturated every being of me. And so, God, today, I surrender it to you. Would you speak like only you can speak? May these not be my words, but may they be yours today. Would you speak and have your way in this place? I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want more. So just to give you a little bit of context behind what is happening here in John chapter 1, Jesus has uh, started his earthly ministry. This is right at the beginning of his earthly ministry. If you couldn't guess by John chapter 1, we're at the beginning, right? And so Jesus has uh, started his earthly ministry. He came to John the Baptist to be baptized. He was baptized. Uh, The father spoke down. A dove came on him, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. The father spoke, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And scripture says immediately after that, Jesus was led by the Spirit, the same Spirit that just came down on him and led him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tested by the devil and spoke a message on that uh, several months ago. Um, So if you want, you can always go back and find that in the archives. That's just a little commercial pitch for that. Um, But Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. That's where he was tested. That's where he was prepared. That's where he was activated for the ministry that God the Father had for him on earth. And so Jesus has come back from the wilderness, and he's passing by where John the Baptist is with several of his disciples. And Jesus is walking by, and I, I, just, I just picture it this way, because you read scripture and you kind of try to picture it, you know, and you formulate maybe what it looked like, and this is probably totally wrong, and so please don't quote me on this. Scripture doesn't specify. There's no pictures, right? There's no pictures in our adult Bibles. It's only in the kid Bibles. And so Jesus is coming, I picture him coming out of the wilderness. So he, scripture says that he immediately left his baptism where John the Baptist was and went into the wilderness. And I just picture Jesus is now coming back from the wilderness, ready to start his earthly ministry. And he passes by where John the Baptist is still doing his ministry. And John the Baptist is there with two of his disciples, which we know from scripture, if you study, it's Andrew and it's John. John being the writer of the gospel that we're looking at. So John the Baptist is there with his disciples, and 
um, Jesus comes back and John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, hey, there he is. There's Jesus, the Lamb of God. And he points him out. He says, there he is. And so then John and Andrew decide to follow Jesus. And that's the story that we're gonna look at today. See, John had disciples, just like Jesus did. John and Andrew were John the Baptist's disciples before they were Jesus's disciples, right? And so he was the one teaching them. John the Baptist was the one teaching John and Andrew before they actually stepped out like we're gonna see today and followed Jesus. They had heard about Jesus, they had heard John the Baptist teach about him and prophesy about him coming, and now he was here. Now he was here. How many of you know that life after you meet Jesus is way better than life before Jesus? Amen? Life after you meet Jesus is way better. Now notice I didn't say it's way easier. It's not easier, it's probably harder, right? You know, but it's way better. I would have it no other way. I would rather be following Jesus and have all the troubles, all the strife, all the anxiety, because I know he's with me than being and living a life without Jesus. It's way better with him, so now that John and Andrew, they've been following John the Baptist. They've been hearing about Jesus. They've been hearing that he's gonna come and all that he's gonna do. And now that he's here, they're like, hey, we're gonna follow him. And so we see that. Let's, let's look back at our scripture. It says the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. And see, John the Baptist wasn't looking to build just a following for himself. He wasn't out to make a name for himself. His soul purpose, his sole reason for existing was to pave the way and prepare the way for Jesus who was coming. That was his sole purpose. That was his reason for existing. That was his mission statement. That was his purpose, was to point to Jesus. It's a lot like this. It's, you like baseball. I love baseball, right? And I love that we finally have the Braves that I can actually do something and actually win some games. There were several years in there that I was really concerned. It was hard to watch. I still watch because I love the Braves and I love baseball. And now we really have something to cheer about because they can hit some home runs now, right? And so they're leading, they're leading the league in home runs. But um, the, the, the lineup in baseball Right, there's a lineup card that the manager prepares every day getting ready for the game. And there's, there's, these aren't just names that get slapped on a card and posted. There's, there's a purpose behind it. And so when they look at the number one and the number two hitters, we call those leadoff hitters. And those are hitters that they have great plate discipline, they have great vision, they can hit really well. And their purpose is to get on base for the cleanup hitters in the three and four and five spots in the lineup. Their sole purpose in that one and two spot is to get on base and they can hit really well, they can draw walks, they can steal bases. Their purpose is to get on base and when they don't get on base, there's nothing really for the cleanup hitters to clean up. So their purpose is to get on base and prepare the way for the batters that are to Come. And that was John the Baptist's mission. He was out to sort of loosen the ground, to prepare the way for Jesus who was to come, who was going to rock the world, who was on a mission to, to, to change lives and to raise people from the dead and to heal those that are sick and to save those that are lost. It was his job to pave the way, to prepare the way so Jesus could come in and hit a grand slam, right? It was his job to prepare the way and line them up and fill the bases so that Jesus could come in and do that which he does best. And so that was John's desire. That's our desire as a church Right, that's our mission statement. We want to bring people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus, not a growing relationship with us. You know, it's not about us that are on staff. We don't want people to come just so they can have a cool place to hang out. No, we exist so people can come and enter into a growing relationship with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And when we get that confused, we've got a problem. 
It's not about a program. It's not about kids' ministry. It's not about a cool worship team. It's not about a cool new song. It's not about a certain message that we have to preach. No, it's about Jesus. And that is the focus and the driving force behind everything that we do. That is the filter that we run everything through because it's Jesus that changes lives. It's Jesus that fixes broken marriages. It's Jesus that heals people. It's not us. It's not a program. It's not a worship set. No, all those things are great, and they're instruments, and they're tools that we have to help reach people and tools that we have to help point people to Jesus. But the purpose and the mission behind why we exist is to point to Jesus. He is why we exist. He is why we do what we do. It's all about him. And John the Baptist knew this. And his disciples knew. His disciples also knew that Jesus was coming. And now that he was here, they didn't have to ask John's permission to go. They just went. They knew that John the Baptist's purpose was to point and say, hey, there he is. There's Jesus. There's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. There he is. He's right behind you. I don't know if you know this. Stop looking at me. Look back there. There he is. And then John and Andrew say, hey, this is it. Let's go. And so John and Andrew leave after they hear that Jesus is passing by. And see, it's not that they didn't appreciate everything that John the Baptist had done to them up to this point. No, they just wanted to be with Jesus. See, they had heard John the Baptist teach about Jesus, but see, they wanted to know Jesus. It's, it's not enough just to hear about him. We wanna, we wanna hear from him. We wanna, we wanna walk with him. We don't wanna just talk about him. We wanna talk with him. We want to talk with him. And so when the opportunity came, they responded, they moved, they acted. And see, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to take the first step. We have to take the first step. If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to take the first step. See, we talk about next steps a lot, right? That's a, it's a part of our vernacular. It's a part of our vocabulary. You know, and as a as a Christian, the, the Christian walk is just a series of next steps. It's, it's one step after another. It's, it's about progression. It's about moving from one place to another place. We talk a lot about next steps, and maybe you're here today, and, and you have a next step. I don't know what that is. It's different for each and every one of us. We never run out of next steps. Maybe you're here today, and your next step is to say, hey, I've sat back here long enough. I've sat behind John the Baptist and I've, I've heard about Jesus, but I don't really know who Jesus is. Today's the day you can take your first step and step out and start to follow him. That's, that, that's your first step and you can do that today. And maybe you're just convinced, I mean, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I need, to, I need to clean myself up. I need to start behaving better. I need to start doing X, Y, Z. I need to start reading my Bible first. No, no. You can never be ready to enter into a relationship with Jesus. You just do it. You just act. You just go. And that's where the transformation comes. That's where the cleaning up happens. You don't, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. You just do it. You step out and you follow him. I, uh, if you know this about me, I love The Office. I love The Office. How many Office fans do we have in the room? Why are we being hesitant about that? I'm not asking you how many of you sinned last night. I'm just asking you if you like The Office. We're like, oh, I don't know. And so I love The Office. I love The Office. And so um, Dan made fun of me because he's like, you would put an Office reference in your message. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I would. And so if you know anything about The Office, there's a point around season five, maybe, Justin and Megan might correct me, but around season five, maybe it's four, uh, Michael Scott, the leader of Dunder Mifflin Paper Company, the, the manager, he leaves to start his own, he leaves to start his own paper company. Smart move, right? Start your own paper company in a dying industry, he's gonna go start his own, right? But if you know anything about Michael Scott, that's par for the course. And so he leaves to start his own paper company and there's a scene where he's being kicked out of the office, literally, and he sneaks back in, he's literally army crawling on the, on the ground and he's trying to recruit those that he's worked with for years to leave and come with him. 
And everybody's like, no, we're good, bro. You know, we're just going to stay here. We've got a paycheck. This is what we know. This is safe. Even though it's a dying industry, this this feels safe. This feels right. I'm going to stay here. And finally, Michael is literally being shoved out the door. And Pam, the receptionist, she just kind of looks and she's like, oh, no. And then she just leaves and follows them. You know, right? She just acts on instinct. There's something, there's something about this man. Yeah, he's off. Yeah, he's naive. Yeah, he's clueless. He doesn't know what he's doing, but there's something about him. And I'm, I'm just going to go with him. I'm going to act. I'm going to follow. I don't even know what I'm getting myself into. I don't even know what's in store. This may crash and burn. I don't know, but I'm going to follow him. And that's what it's like as Christians. We see Jesus and we see something different. And we're like, man, I've tried everything else. I've tried everything else. And there's something different about this man. There's something different about those that already follow him. And I want something that he has to offer. And so we step out and we follow him. And you have to take your first step. You have to take your first step. And so maybe you've been coming, you've been listening, you've been hearing the calling, but you've never acted. You've been sitting on the sidelines. Again, like I said, maybe like John the Baptist was teaching the crowds and John and Andrew were there. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've been coming. Maybe you've been observing and listening. Maybe you've been joining online. Maybe you've just been curious about what's going on, but you never have taken that first step. You can today. Do it today. Don't think about it, just do it. Just act, just go for it. And see, sometimes the devil's greatest victory is just to get you to stay right where you are. And that's not necessarily to say if he can just, he can have a victory if he can keep you from following Jesus. No, if you're here today and you've been following Jesus for one year, two years, 10 years, 40 years, I don't care what it is, maybe you've been following Jesus a long time, the devil can have a victory in your life if he can get you to stay right where you are. If he can keep you paralyzed, he'll keep you from progressing. If he can keep you paralyzed, if he can keep you still, If he can do that, then he has a foothold in your life. And I'm sure Andrew and John felt comfortable following John the Baptist. It was what they knew. It's what they had done for a long time. It felt right. It felt comfortable. It felt easy. We know what to expect. We know what John the Baptist expects from us. And so they had the option to stay. They had the option to stay with John the Baptist But see, they weren't content with just what was comfortable. They wanted more. They wanted what Jesus had to offer. Jesus had something more for them, but in order to get it, they had to take their first step. Let's keep reading. Verse 38. So John and Andrew, they step out and they follow Jesus and says this in verse 38, says, turning around, Jesus saw them following, and he asked, what do you want? What are you after? What is it that you're seeking? What do you want from me? He was asking them a question, and it's the same question that Jesus asks today. What do you want? What do you want? Why are you following me? What is it that you're really after? What what do you want? And maybe, maybe you come to church every week, maybe you go to small group every week, maybe you get up and you read your Bible every day, maybe you listen to podcasts on Spotify, maybe you listen to other pastors on YouTube and you do all these things, but the question is the same as it is for someone that's not a follower of Jesus. What do you, what do you want? Why are you in this? What are you looking for? What are you trying to get from me? And I'm sure if we passed a piece of paper around this morning and asked everybody to answer that question, of what do you want, I'm sure we would get a myriad of responses. You know, some people are probably looking for 
uh, a miracle or you're looking for breakthrough or maybe you're looking for a blessing from the Lord. I don't know. What, what would your answer to that question B, maybe you just need to process that today. If Jesus were here and he was standing here and he said, hey, what do you want? What would you say? What would you say? What would your answer to him be? And so Jesus did this with Andrew and John. He asked them, what do you want? See, Jesus needed them to say what they wanted so they could see what they needed. Right? He needed them to say what they wanted so they could see what they needed. Remember back when Charlotte takes our hand and takes us to the pantry or wherever it is that she wants to go for us to get something for her that she wants. What does she learn in the process? She learns, I can't do this on my own. I need mom and dad to do it for me. I need mom and dad. Yes, I want X, Y, Z, or I want this, that, or the other, but what I need is mom and dad. And see, if Jesus can ask us a question of what do you want, and he can get us to say the answer, then he can lead us on a path to learn and see what we really need, and that's him. There's a, there's a well-known story a few chapters over. I'm gonna turn there myself. John chapter four, y'all turn to John chapter four. There's a story, uh, I, I love this story that's in the Bible. Um, it's the woman that's at the well in Samaria. Um, and there's just so many things that you can glean from this story. There's so many things going on here. We could preach sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon on this. But I just want us to look at this story because I believe it's so very, very vitally important to understand exactly what we're talking about today. So John chapter four, again, it's gonna be on the screens if you need to follow along with us. It says this in verse seven. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Actually, I'm going to back up. Screens, you don't have this. You don't have this. But we're going to back up to verse 6. Um, so it says, Jacob's well was there as Jesus was passing through. And it says, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. It's always important to get context right to the story, to know what time it is, to know what the weather was like, you know, right? And so here's Jesus, he's passing through, it's noon, it's the heat of the day, and he sits down by the well. All right, verse seven, you guys have this, you can see this part. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? See, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink. All right, so just notice how, this, notice how this story started out. Notice how this story started out, how Jesus engaged in conversation. He asked her a question. And we've already talked a little bit why questions are important. Jesus is posing a question to her just like he did to John and Andrew. Although it's a different, different question, he's leading her in a way that she can give her a response, but ultimately see what she really needs. And so he asks her, he says, will you give me a drink? And so, she, so then she responds, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from, it, drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But you, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal Life And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And let's pause there for a second because here's, here's this woman. Here's this woman. And there's so many, again, there's so many things in this story that we could, we could talk about. She's coming at noon because she can't come when all the other women come because you're about to see why. 
And that's the lifestyle in which she lives. So she's coming to the well at noon, and she comes to this well day after day after day, drawing the same water that she drew the day before, and that she drew the day before, and the, and the water that she drew the day before that. And Jesus is offering her something more. He's offering her something more, but she doesn't completely understand what it is yet. She hasn't connected the dots. And Jesus is leading her on a path to, to see what she really needs. And so the story goes on, and Jesus, basically just to summarize this, I'm going to summarize this. So basically, Jesus says, hey, go get your husband and come back. Go get your husband. And then I just see her dejected. She sort of, you know, lowers her head in shame, and she says, you know, I, I don't have a husband. I don't have a husband. He says, you know, you're right. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the man you're living now with is not your husband. Really, he was a friend, a friend with benefits, if you know what I'm saying. She had tried the marriage thing. And I, I would imagine if you've been married five times, you wouldn't get married a sixth time either. Like, what's the hope? Something's, something's not working. Something's not, not clicking there. And so she had been with not one man, not two men, not three, not four, and not five. But now a sixth man. And something wasn't, something wasn't satisfying her. Until this day rolls around. She picks up her jar just like any other day. She picks up her jar just like any other day, and she sits out to the well like she did every other day, following in the same path that she followed every other day. But today was different. Today, Jesus was at the well. Jesus was at the well. Jesus was waiting for her at the well. And so she had tried six other men to satisfy that which was that she had a longing for, whatever it is that she was looking for, she was looking for acceptance, whatever it was that she was looking for, she tried it in six other men, but when she found the seventh man, it was over. It was over. And that number seven is significant. That number seven is significant. In the Bible, it's the number of perfection, our completeness. Jesus was the only man that could satisfy what it was that she was ultimately looking for. He was the only man. He was the seventh man. And today, how many of us, how many of us keep going to the same old well Day after day after day after day, exhausted, tired, spent. You keep visiting the same old well, the same old habits, the same old addictions. Every day, every day you bear that burden, you bear that weight. And everybody's well looks different. Everybody's well looks different. Maybe your well looks like a liquor bottle. And when you get to the bottom of it, you're just as empty as when you took the first sip. Maybe your well looks like a website. Maybe your well looks like a relationship or relationships, just like this woman. Maybe your well looks like a bad eating habit. We all have a well, and we could keep naming wells all morning. We can name wells that no one ever sees. Wells like jealousy. Wells that look like gossip. 
wells that look like pride. We all have wells. And we keep going back to the same well day after day after day. But today, the well, capital W, is sitting on your well. He's sitting there. And he's waiting. And why, why do you keep coming here every day, filling your jar up with things that will never satisfy, things that will never quench your thirst, things that will never meet the need of that which you are looking for? And Jesus is saying, I'm here. I'm here. And so go down to the end of this story. In verse 25, it says, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. She says, I've heard about him. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. <laughs> and highlight this. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The one that you know about is here, and now you can know me. Now you can know me. You don't have to just know about the stories. You don't have to just know about the prophecies. No, you can know me. See, it wasn't enough to just know about Jesus. She was being invited to know him personally. She was being invited to know him one-on-one, -on -one, like a friend. She was being invited into a relationship with him. And you see, there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. <laughs> there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference. And so back in our original story, this is what John and Andrew wanted. They wanted to know Jesus personally. Look back at this. So, so, so John and Andrew, they step out. They step out to follow Jesus, and Jesus turns around, and he says, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? <laughs> what do you want? That's wherever you're going. <laughs> wherever it is that you're staying tonight. Wherever it is that this road leads you, that's where we want it to lead us. That's where we want to go. I don't care where it is. We just want to follow you. We just want to know you. So where are you staying? That's where we want to go. And Jesus says, come, and you will see. See, when Jesus asked them the question, I want, or, or when he asked them the question, what do you want? Their response was this. In essence, what they were saying was, I want more. I want more. I want more than what I've already got. I've heard a lot. I've seen a lot. I've witnessed a lot. I've, I've heard a lot from John the Baptist, and it's been great. No offense, John, it's been awesome. It's been a great time. But we want more. We want more. We're tired of just talking about Jesus. We wanna talk with him. We wanna talk with him. I know, John, you've taught us a lot about him, and we've learned a lot, but now we wanna learn from him. So we're going to go. We're going to follow him. We've walked with John. Now we want to walk with Jesus. They wanted more. They wanted more. I want to close with this in Philippians chapter 3. The, Apo uh, the Apostle Paul writes this about what he wants. He says this. He says, 
but whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And look at this, <laughs> look at this, verse 10. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Again, if I had to pass a piece of paper around this morning and Jesus were to ask, what do you want? What would your response be? What would your response be? Would you just think of the immediate need that you have right now in your life? Well, man, my car needs to be <laughs> repaired. Or man, my, my kid's sick. Or hey, my, my parents are struggling. Or hey, my, my marriage is in shambles. And so what do I want, Jesus? I want that to be better. Can you, can you make that better? Can you meet my need? Can you, can you give me that which I want? Or would your response be like, Paul, and all you would write on the piece of paper is, I want to know Christ. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what comes next. What I want to know is Jesus. What I want to know is Christ. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. See, if there was ever a person that had everything that they wanted in life, it was Paul. He had a good family, he was well-educated, he was looked up to, he was respected, he was high in society, he was religious. From the outside looking in, man, there's nothing else that he could want more. If he were alive today, he would be probably a household name. He would have thousands of followers on Instagram. Everybody would be subscribed to his YouTube channel. He'd probably be driving a nice car. He'd probably be, you know, on talk shows. You'd probably have podcasts with him. Everybody would know who he was, but what does he say right here? He says, whatever were gains to me, whatever were gains to me, whatever the popularity, whatever the the subscription number, how many ever followers I have, I count it all as loss. I count it all as loss. I count it all as garbage. It's all worthless. And if you ask me, Jesus, what do you want? I want to know you. I want to know Christ. I want to know you, so ask me again. Ask me again, Jesus, what do I want? I want you. I want more. I want more. I want more than this life has to offer me. I want more than success. I want more than achieving my dreams. I want more than the nine to five. I want more than the grind. I want more than the nice family. I want more than the picket fence and the big house and the nice car. All those things are great. But if you were to say, hey, what do I want? I want Jesus. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. All those other things don't matter. I want more than what this world has to offer me. I want more than what the devil tempts me with day in and day out. I want more than what my sin has to offer me. I want more than that well that I keep going to every day at noon. I want more than that trudge holding this big heavy jar, walking to the well. I want more than that. I want more than that. Jesus, would you give me more? Would you give me more? I know I've heard a lot about you. I know I've heard a lot of stories about how great you are, but Jesus, would you give me more? 
Would you give me more? I want more of you. So what do I want? I want more of you. I want more of you in my life. I want more of you in my quiet time. I want more of you in my family. I want more of you in my job. I want more of you on my commute. Some of you need that today. I need more of you on my commute to work. It doesn't look a whole lot like Jesus. I need a little bit more in that. I need more today. I want more of it in my finances, in my hobbies, whatever it is, whatever it is that your hands find to do and wherever it is that your feet set out to go, I want more. Is that how you would answer the question today? If Jesus were here and he looked at you and no one else was here, no one else was here and he said, what do you want? What would your answer be? What would your response be? Would it be like Paul? Would it be like John and Andrew? Or would you just name off the next thing that you want on your list from God? And then when you get that, it's like he never was around. <laughs> And then when something else comes up, you're like, hey, I want that. And you're like, it's like you're grabbing God by the hand and you're saying, hey, come over here. Can you, can you give me that? Can you give me that? I want that. Are you satisfied with just having him? Just having him? I want more. I want. I want more. Y'all close your eyes. <sighs> Maybe you're here today and you never have taken your first step. Maybe you've been coming for a few weeks or maybe you've been coming a few months. Maybe you've been here for years and you've just been coming every week You've been listening. You've been observing. You've been spectating. And you would say, I know a lot about Jesus. I know a lot about him, but I don't know him. Maybe that's you today. Today's the day to take your next step and take your first step and following Jesus. Today's the day that you can do that. I just want you to invite you to pray this prayer silently at your seat. No one's looking around. No one sees you. No one hears you. But you can ask him today. And you can say, Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. And today, I ask him to be the savior of my life. I believe that Jesus died so that I could be forgiven and rose again so I could have life. Today, I receive that new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Every eye closed. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer, I just want you to lift your hand. I just want to lift your hand in the room. I see that hand. I see that hand. If you prayed that prayer today, just raise that hand. Just raise that hand. I see you. If you're online and you prayed that today, wherever you are, in your car, at your house, in your apartment, on the beach, I don't care where you are. If you're here today and you say, I've never taken my first step, but today I prayed that prayer. Just raise your hand, or if you're online, click that button. Those of you that prayed that prayer, I just want you to look at me. Everybody else, his eyes are closed, heads are bowed. Just look at me, look at me. There's a next step card in front of you. Like I said earlier, our mission, our desire as a church is to come alongside you and help you go into a growing relationship with Jesus. Today is not the end, today is the beginning. 
today is the beginning. So take that card that's in front of you. I want you to fill it out. I want you to check the box that says, hey, I prayed today to receive Jesus. I prayed today to receive Jesus and I wanna know more about him. I wanna know what my next step is, what I can do next. And I can tell you this, we're baptizing next week. That's what you need to do. You need to be here. You need to be baptized. You need to proclaim to everyone that, hey, I was lost, but now I am found. I have found Jesus and he is the Lord of my life. And I publicly declare that through baptism. That happens next week. We wanna help you take that next step. So take that card, go to Next Step Central out in the lobby. Somebody's waiting there to celebrate with you. Give you a handshake, give you a hug and tell you what you can do next in your walk with Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you're like, I follow Jesus, I follow him, but I've lost sight of what I really need. And I've gotten so focused on this well that I keep going to every day, every night, and I've lost sight of that which I really need and that's Jesus. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand in the room? Just raise your hand in the room and just say, hey, I've lost sight. I've lost sight of what I really need and there's no shame in that. There's no shame in that. I just wanna pray for you. Y'all pray with me and agree. Father, we thank you today that you have spoken, that you have moved, that you have moved hearts to follow you, that you've drawn people to yourself. And today, even those that are followers of you that have lost sight of what it is that they really need. God, would you awaken their hearts to you? Would you awaken their hearts to you? And would you draw us back? We fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. Well, if you're here today and you have a next step, whatever that is, Whatever that is, I know there are those that have given their life to Jesus today. Can we just celebrate that in the house today? Come on. Yeah. If you're here today and you'd like to be baptized, again, we're baptizing next week. If you're here today and you wanna know more about Avalon Church, you can go to Next Step Central, talk to somebody. We can get you plugged into a group. We can get you serving here at the church. We can get you set up for our next step class that's coming up soon in a few weeks. We can get you signed up for all that. Whatever your next step is today, don't get stagnant in your faith. Don't get comfortable with where you are now. Don't don't be content with where you are now. Want more, want more, want more than what you have now. Can we just stand? Can we stand to our feet? I'm just gonna pray one more time just to dismiss us and then you guys can go home and have a great Memorial Day weekend. Father, we thank you that you have met with us today. We thank you that you have spoken, that you have moved, that your spirit has been here today. I thank you for how you've ministered to my heart. There's no place else I would have rather been today but right here, but right here. I thank you for each and every person that's here today. I pray for them as they leave here, as they leave this place, would you be with them this week? Would you keep their eyes fixed on you? Would they be fixed on you this week? Not for the things that they want, but God, to know that you are what they really need. And as long as they have you, they have everything. They have everything. God, I pray for all those that are joining us online, wherever they find themselves at today, God, be with them, bless them, bless their families. Be with us, Lord. Give us a great week and bring us back next week. And we love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, all right, you guys have a great week. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.